So welcome back to Everything Marketplaces, where we talk with marketplace founders and leaders from some of today's top marketplaces. So this is episode 20, and I'm excited to welcome on Jay Patel, who's currently the Director of Product Management at Science Exchange. So if you're not familiar with Science Exchange, it's the world's leading B2B marketplace for outsourced research and development, and has raised over 70 million from top tier funds, such as Union Square Ventures, Collab Fund, Silicon Valley Bank, and others. So very little has been shared on Science Exchange in the past, so I'm super excited to dive into it with Jay and learn more about it as a leading B2B marketplace. So Jay, it's great to have you join us today. And uh, before we get into Science Exchange, let's maybe start off by you sharing a little bit more on your background and how you got into marketplaces. Yeah, totally. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So, um, you know, I'll take a few steps back. Um, so when I was an undergrad, I was actually a researcher um, doing, you know, work on biofuels and things along those lines. And I studied bioengineering um, at Berkeley. And, you know, I realized kind of early on that I loved science, but doing research wasn't really the right fit for me. So I ended up stumbling my way into an internship and then a full-time offering consulting where I worked with some really great people who mentored me to help me understand various aspects of business strategy, growth strategy, and go-to-market strategy. Um, but kind of realized I wanted to build something more tangible um, and see how I could help make that come to life. So um, ended up coming in contact with some folks at Science Exchange and it seemed like a great opportunity. The market you know, was really, really large. Um, the team was really great. Um, so I ended up taking a role over um, initially joining our commercial strategy team um, as a product strategy uh, manager and then moving on to kind of help build out the product function with my current manager. Um, so that's kind of how I got into science change itself. Nice. Yeah. Thanks for sharing more about that. So maybe uh, just for those that don't know about science exchange uh, as a marketplace business, could you kind of break it down for us a little bit? Yeah, sure thing. So, um, you know, we're a marketplace for outsourcing research and development. So what does that mean? Um, we, we primarily focus on services. So you could imagine like, let's say you're working on a DNA sequencing project. There might be someone who can do, you know, the whole study for you and parts of it. So we help connect you with folks who can actually do that as part of our pre-contracted network um, and they can fulfill those studies. But, you know, as we've matured more as a, as a product and as a business, we've gone from just doing these isolated cases where you might just want to do a one-off, you know, assessment to actually helping manage larger programs or larger projects. So, you know, someone might say, hey, I have this asset. So that might be a drug candidate that can maybe solve for, let's say, you know, something in cardiovascular diseases. Um, they might say, well, I need to run four different studies. So how can I manage all of those? Because those could be different, you know, uh, tests that are being done. You might want to do something, test something in a mouse. You might want to test something in a Petri dish and things like that. So, you know, you can kind of group those requests together and manage them a lot more fluidly on our platform. So as, as we've grown, it's gone from being just managing an individual project to actually helping manage, you know, groups of projects or, you know, help get larger programs onto the platform. Nice, nice. And uh, on that note, maybe just the evolution of it as a marketplace. Um, could you kind of uh, share a little bit more about like the early days and then how it evolved as a marketplace? Yeah, sure thing. No, it's a really interesting story. And I, you know, I joined a few years in, um, but you know, we were, we're a scientist founded and scientist led company. So our CEO, uh, Elizabeth Irons, she was a, you know, can't, uh, she was a professor and who also did a lot of research um, as well. Uh, and so we started off initially more as an academic marketplace. So we would connect folks who were at different um, research institutions who would want to buy or sell services from like their own labs. But, you know, after a few years of that, we actually started moving more into the enterprise space. Um, so initially started, you know, uh, with one enterprise customer on the buy side, but then since then we've expanded to significantly more. Um, but you know, we're going from kind of a almost a C to C type marketplace into being a more proper B two B marketplace in the last few years. Um, and with that comes a number of different capabilities, right? So you know, initially it was a lot more about search and discovery, and we still have that. Um, but now it's about you know, if the core is the marketplace, how do you now build on top of that for other enterprise grade features? So things that our customers care about are stuff like, you know, configurable workflows or the ability to see reporting on aggregated spend, um, things along those lines. And so as we've kind of pivoted from being more C to C type to B to B, we've been able to also kind of evolve our product and meet those enterprise grade requirements. Nice. And then uh, just so we can get a sense of like the, the scale at that point, kind of that at that uh, pivot, I guess we could call it. 
Um, could you, are there, is there anything you can share around that? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, we've been growing like rapidly year over year. Um, you know, why I can't give exact bookings figures, you know, the yeah. overall like R and D market is, especially for outsourcing is massive. I mean, if we're looking at just like pharma, so, you know, R and D is done by, um, you know, our, uh, pharma as well as agri science, as well as energy and a whole bunch of different disciplines. But if we just narrowed the view to just R and D and pharma, itself and life sciences, that's to the tune of, I think 50 billion a year was something that was cited by Credit Suisse um, that's being outsourced. And so the market opportunity is pretty massive, especially since the technology we have can go across all of those. Got it, got it, cool. And then, um, so what were, so, uh, or I guess we'll uh, focus a little bit on the, on the product side. So, you know, how do you guys, could, could you explain a little bit more about how you kind of break down product management internally, kind of given the large market and given all the different opportunities? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, so, you know, I break down our product development process into four big buckets. So we identify opportunities, we prioritize those opportunities, we build uh, things with the broader product development team, and then we harvest the ROI from those things that we've built. Um, and you know, we've got a pretty great team. We've got a team full of product managers. We've got designers and UX researchers. We've got project managers. We've got um, engineers. And so you know, it's a very multidisciplinary team, and we work very closely with our commercial colleagues and other folks throughout the business to understand what the opportunities are both from a you know, market growth standpoint, but also like from ways to even reduce costs, right? And streamline our internal processes as we scale. So we look at a number of different possible projects and we try to um, you know, prioritize them across various frameworks. The, the oftentimes they boil down to something simple, like well, what's the value of doing this thing? When's, what's the effort of you know, trying to make this work cross-functionally? And then when, you know, what's the time to pay off? Like when do we think we'd see a meaningful move in the metric we're trying to address? Um, but so we, we do it that way. I think one of the learnings I've had, um, I, and I learned this when I was initially a consultant, but been trying to carry it forward here is, you know, building a product that you can't do in isolation. Um, it's a team sport. Um, you have to think through the go-to-market strategy, the relevant business models or pricing associated with things, and how you're actually going to extract the value I and mean, deliver value to your users all at once. So you know, I think sometimes, you know, there, there can be a trap of building the shiniest new feature, but if no one's going to be able to use it, or if we can't actually sell on it, um, you know, then it's, it may not be the best investment. So we try to think about the whole, the whole spectrum from identifying all the way through harvesting um, before we make our decisions as to what we're going to work on. Nice, nice. And then is, uh, is there any specific example of maybe, uh, you know, like a feature or um, that recently you guys uh, rolled out and how you kind of approached it? Yeah, good question. So maybe what's helpful is I can talk about two examples because um, it actually kind of talks, it kind of gets to like even how we do decision making um, mm -hmm. as, as in the product management function. So one of the things that I've learned in my time here is stratifying your decisions based on like, you know, how mature that feature or product is. So, you know, if you're trying to go from zero to one, the way you would assess things, the information you look at, like how much you rely on your gut it's gonna be very different than trying to optimize something that's already existing. So going from like step nine to step 10. So, um, you know, two examples I can speak to are, you know, we, so one of the main workflows we have is as a buyer, you can, you know, send out a, you can create a request and you can send that request to four different possible providers. And if you want, you can get competitive quotes, compare pricing, compare timelines, compare, you know, scope and capabilities that way. Um, the workflow we used to have for that was a little bit more cumbersome. Like you'd have to make a request and then it's sent to one person. Then you'd have to know that like somewhere on that page is a button where you can click it and then send it to another person. And then you click it again, you send it to another person. Not the most intuitive thing, but it was a workflow and feature that existed. Um, and, you know, one of the asks that we have from some of the stakeholders who from an enterprise standpoint use us, um, and this is like more like a procurement type stakeholder or a finance type stakeholder is they wanted to see, hey, how can science exchange help, you know, drive more competitive bidding for the, you know, their organization. So um, one thing we considered was, well, what if we built like a shopping cart type feature where it's, you know, the workflow exists today, but if we redesign it in a way where when you first build out the, um, you know, first build your request, you can select, send it to these four people at once. Um, so we built a workflow around that. And that's the case where we were, we already had a metric we cared about, which was, hey, we've got a lot of data on, 
you know, the number of um, providers that are tied to any given request. Uh, we, call them, we call our suppliers providers internally. Um, and so then after we made this change, we could see how that moved. Um, and you know, comparing that to a different project like where we built out some compliance features, um, some of those like we, we, you know, we went from zero to one in some cases. Um, so it's, you know, we might have had other capabilities around compliance, but we're saying let's add this new feature, see how that works. And some of that is a lot more based on like user research uh, around like interviews, trying to, you know, rely on your gut feel and trying to empathizing with the user needs. Uh, you know, we care about user empathy across both going from zero to one or from nine to 10, but for zero to one, where you just don't have enough data because things didn't exist before, you do have to go more with your gut and how you feel like, you know, what might succeed and then just really track it and monitoring it. Um, did that answer the question or happy to dive more into? Oh, no, that was great. Yeah, thanks for giving an example on that. So, um, I mean, you brought up quite a bit that I want to touch on. Uh, one specifically, though, was uh, just speaking to like the supply breakdown of the industry. Um, I'm, you know, does it, is there a huge variance as far as, you know, your providers or is, uh, you know, is there like a typical kind of uh, provider? Yeah, good question. So um, the way I would actually view it is if we take a step back a little bit into segmentation. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the R&D marketplace, the R&D like market is massive, right? As I mentioned earlier, you've got like life sciences, but you've also got energy, agri-science, all these other areas. Um, and while we've got customers across all of them, the primary focus has been on the life sciences space, um, you know, particularly helping get more therapies to market into patients sooner. So with that, like our provider network is generally more geared towards that, but there's crossover, right? So, you know, DNA testing or DNA sequencing, that stuff is something that's almost agnostic in some ways. Like, you know, that matters when you're doing stuff in agri-science, matters when you're thinking about stuff in you know, energy, if you're thinking biofuels, for example, and it also matters in stuff like for healthcare applications. So um, our provider network in many ways can serve multiple markets, um, but we focus a little bit more on like the, the life sciences area in particular. And then as far as within that bucket, like I think you were saying like breakdown. So, you know, we could think about it as like who are large players who exist and who are smaller players who exist and who are academic institutions as well. Um, so we've got spread across all of those. For life sciences R and D in particular, I think it's like for the ten biggest like subcategories. Um, like there's a handful of like big players who take a lot of the like the lion's share of the market, but then there's this massive amount of you know tail spender tail providers who do. I think it's like over fifty percent for a lot of them. So it's an industry that's pretty you know pretty ripe for being disrupted by a marketplace. But we also have found that once our customers have used us for you know, let's say piloting, you know, certain categories of spend on us. Um, they actually then want to bring on their established relationships as well. So it's not just the discovery that we were able to, you know, help serve with, but it's also actually given that we help streamline, you know, financial um, like pay payment processing stuff. They also use this for, you know, their relationships across that spectrum. So whether it's with folks they already have contracts and relationships with or folks who they don't. Awesome. So uh, on, on that note, so what, what is the specific value when they bring in their uh, maybe existing, um, you know, their exist, well, we won't call them providers, but, you know, the contractors kind of within your platform? Um, I'm assuming at that point, uh, there's some value of a kind of tool, tools that you provide for them or? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So yeah, there's like, the way I think about it is like, there's a few different use cases. One is, hey, I know someone and I want to work with them. And the other one is, I don't know someone and I want to work with them. The latter case is typically what you see for marketplaces, right? That's oftentimes why there's so much of an emphasis on discovery and matchmaking. But for the first case, you know, you could break it down into two more buckets. Like one is we've got an established contract and relationship. So what's the value there of bringing it onto a platform like Science Exchange? And the other one is, I know as a user who I want to work with, but my organization isn't contracted with them. And for that, we're, you know, you know, we've got very established and very fast um, provider recruitment processes. So we're able to kind of leapfrog that compared to their own internal legal processes. But for that other case that, you know, that we mentioned around, like they already have the legal agreements uh, in place. It's really around providing more transparency for all the work that's being done to relevant stakeholders internally at our buyers, as well as streamline the payment processes. So, you know, just if we you know, think about those roles, and it's so like in, um, for, for our product, 
we've got the end user, but there's also like these four or five other personas, depending on where, uh, like which business it is, um, that also will come to play. Some of those include things like manager type roles, operational type roles, procurement type roles. And before our product existed, it's really hard to like get a good view of what is all of the outsourced R&D activity that your business is doing. These things exist in silos, right? There's ERP systems they use, there's you know, electronic lab notebooks they use, there's collaboration technologies they use, there's email. Um, and it's really hard for someone who is responsible for helping you know, manage the, those programs or portfolios in aggregate to actually know what's going on. So that's one of the value drivers for why they use us for the cases where they already have those contracts in place is now there's one single pane of glass where they can see everything at one quick view. Um, so that's one value driver, but the other one is actually the streamlined payment processes. So we function as a centralized billing entity um, and that makes it easier for them from like a, like a you know, supplier relationship management to, you know, if they have issues, they can escalate it just to us or one, 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 uh, one point of contact. So, those are two of the main value drivers around why they would bring over their direct relationships over. And we built, you know, features and experiences to support that. So, you know, we built out the ability to, you know, use, let them use their direct contracts, but then reference our payment processes for those relevant orders. Um, and I think over time, as we continue trying to, you know, serve that use case, we'll see more investment from our business into relevant features and offerings that can really, you know, make that a differentiated experience as well. Nice. Thanks for uh, sharing more on that. So we actually had a question from uh, Jack in here and, and he was asking, it's a provider. So are they inviting, uh, are, are they inviting the uh, contractors in that case? And then there's an, there's an onboarding experience. Like, could you maybe uh, show a bit more about that? Yeah. So for us, that's, that's, so it's a good question for us in general, what happens is we're connecting one buyer with one provider or one like contractor of sorts. Um, I do know that other marketplaces like SmartCat, which is a, like a language translation agency, like they have, it's like a multi-sided marketplace where it's like, you might be a buyer, you're buying it from an agency and that agency is then farming out work to more con contractors. We don't necessarily, like that could happen through our platform today, but it's not really built in as part of the core experience at the moment. Um, but I think it's over time we might see that. So you know, if we, like, if I take a step back and talk about like the R&D market uh, within pharma, you could break that down into preclinical, you could break that down into clinical, you can break that down into, you know, phase four, HUR, those types of studies. And in the clinical space in particular, there is like more of that type of like, almost like agency type of use case, where like you might work with someone who might then, you know, bring on a site manager or certain like individuals with a contract out to. So, as we further um, evolve to, you know, support those cases more strongly, I think we might build out you know, more of that type of model. But right now, it's usually just one entity to one more entity. Got it. Cool. Thanks for uh, sharing more on that. Um, so I, I think uh, one of the one of the big realizations here is, of, of course, that marketplaces are typically built on trust. And just given the industry, could you maybe speak to how you built that initial trust and how you think about that as a marketplace? Yeah, sure thing. So, you know, yeah, when we think about the challenges for B2B marketplaces versus like a B2C or C2C, like trust and safety is one of the biggest, biggest drivers for like why a B2B marketplace um, can, can, you know, drive value, value there. So, um, you know, our customers are less price sensitive, but they care more about making sure they're working with folks who have the capabilities they want and folks who are trusted and qualified. So <coughs> we, we saw, like we serve that in a number of ways. Um, so from our origins, we, you know, we, as part of that investment, the discovery experience, we've got, you know, search, we've got filters, we've got ratings and reviews like that serves as one way to, to, you know, foster trust in the marketplace. Cause you're able to see like, you know, how is, you know, what is the performance of this provider and things like that. But other ways that we've done it as we've evolved to be in more enterprise grade software, actually allowing for custom catalogs and configurability of that. So as a buyer, you can say, hey, you know, this is a preferred relationship or preferred provider for this organization to use, or the, the, this, this one is uh, qualified for certain types of regulated work. And we've got various mechanisms like tagging and stuff like that that can support that in the search experience. But we also have doubled down on a lot of other capabilities there too. So if we think about the types of work that our marketplace supports, some of those are very regulated categories. So you could imagine like human biospecimens, which is a case where you're like buying actual human tissue to do a study on. 
like that comes with a lot of compliance considerations. Like you care about donor consent, you care about, you know, like the chain of custody of that sample, all of these various things. So as part of that, um, and you know, similar for animal welfare considerations for other types of projects, et cetera, et cetera. So we built up other features um, and tied experiences based on that as well. So we've got this, um, this assessment tool we call Evident. Um, and essentially it's an ability for, you know, we, we make this centralized like assessment where it can help qualify a provider and their processes as being, you know, best in class or not. So um, that, that helps streamline some things, it allows us to serve more as like a, the ability to give a standard or set a standard for what is best in class compliance for, for end users. So by surfacing all these different pieces of information from reviews and ratings to their qualification for certain types of regulated work, we like with that transparency, it's easier for an end user to be able to like know who they want to work with because at first glance, they can filter and say, yep, this person, I already know like they can do this work. I don't have to go through this massive legal approval or massive internal compliance approvals. Like it's already been done for me. Nice. It sounds like that. Yeah, that's like a huge uh, value add for sure. Um, so I do have a question on that as far as with the uh, with the new kind of contractors um, that, that come within your marketplace. Is there do they kind of view it as like this is my industry kind of profile and like accreditation? And how do you think about that kind of with like a network versus like the transactional kind of ratings and reviews and kind of building that? Yeah, good question. So, you yeah, know, when new um, providers join our platform, they do have the ability to create storefronts on our platform. Um, and so that's kind of like in many ways, you call it like a marketing page where it's like they can upload their, you know, past work they've done, upload photos, they can upload their service services, things like that. Um, oftentimes it's similar to what they might have if they have their own website itself. Um, but then, you know, one of the things we try to do is encourage them to also take these assessments. So that way they're able to show up on the search results as being promoted in that regards, um, that they have those capabilities. Um, so that sets them apart from their competition and, and things like that. So it is an area that where, you know, that they do those activities. And I think, you know, as we go forward, We'll try to find more ways to almost gamify it so it's easier as part of the onboarding experience to you know show them that you could do this um so that's that's an area that we're considering as far as the onboarding experience goes nice nice and then uh just we we haven't really spoken about it yet um and i'm not sure how much you can share but could you maybe speak to um your monetization strategy as a marketplace sure thing so uh, we primarily make a revenue on the buy side of the marketplace um, and within that, you know, we're primarily enterprise serving. We do have, um, you know, an open marketplace as we call it, which is a transactional fee one, but that's a very small piece of our business. Um, but the vast majority of our revenue comes from like enterprise subscriptions, for example. So those are, you know, the enterprise packages we include things like reporting, configurable workflows, custom catalogs, stuff along those lines, um, as well as integrations. Nice. Nice. And then, uh, so I, I guess on, on that note too, as far as like an open marketplace, and then you have kind of like the enterprise side of it. I mean, uh, you did kind of mention briefly before, uh, as far as a little bit uh, about how you kind of think about product, but could you maybe speak to the kind of the team or the org structure and um, how you guys focus and kind of prioritize the different aspects of your business as a marketplace? Yeah, no, that's a really great question. Um, and it's one that we're always thinking about as what is our operating model to best serve our various users. Um, I know a lot of other like marketplace companies will organize themselves around a particular user group. So um, when I talked to some mentors at other, other companies, they'd mentioned that they'd had like one team for their suppliers, one team for their buyers, one team for internal tools, and one team for integrations. That's a common model. Um, we don't have that model at the moment. What we actually do is more so focus on initiatives. So we'll say, hey, we have this strategic initiative to like redesign this part of the experience. So let's find the folks who are, you know, internally who are best equipped to help solve for those. Um, and, you know, also we match up with geography. So our teams are more so based around that, um, based on where they are located, as well as the initiatives we're doing at the moment, as opposed to necessarily just the user group. But I think over time, we might evolve that. I think it just kind of depends on, you know, like what problems we're trying to solve um, specifically at that point in time. Got it. Cool. And then um, just, just so we can all have a little bit of, uh, of context, what's the, uh, like the overall kind of like team size? Yeah, good question. So um, science change overall is about 50 to 60 people. Um, so yeah, pretty small. Like, I mean, we, 
you know, we've been around for a little bit, um, but I think we, we've kept a pretty lean team. We're pretty good at finding ways to, you know, like scale um, using both our technology and our processes. And we're always finding ways to improve on that, those regards. Nice. And then are you, would you say like right now, um, are you guys a kind of supply or demand constrained marketplace? Yeah, good question. Uh, I'd say demand constrained marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, at the end of the day, we're trying to outsource like programs and projects, and those um, those essentially are driven by like the budgets of folks who are doing the R and D, and that oftentimes comes from like you know like if, if we think take a couple, a couple of steps back, like if we're talking about the life sciences marketplace, we're trying to say how can we get you know more therapies that can save lives to you know patients sooner. And that essentially comes down to, well, where do those companies that come up with those therapies, like where are they investing? What therapeutic areas are they considering? Um, things like that. So I'd say we're very much demand demand driven from that regards. And then is that, so, so is, speak on that note, as far as like, you know, where they're spending um, and their kind of priorities, is that, does that change quickly or is it, uh, you know, is that like a kind of like a multi-year kind of process? Yeah, that's a good question. I know I think it depends on the stage of drug development in particular. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like clinical trials, like those can last for years. And so once you have, you know, if you're a if you're a provider and you have a contract in that space, like there's some stability there. But when we're talking about preclinical in particular, um, you know, those are faster. There's a lot more variability, right? So you might be trying to screen like you have multiple targets, you have multiple studies you want to do, like you might do a lot of really short studies and then narrow down to like, hey, these are the two, you know, these are the two, um, you know, assets that have the most promise. And then you spend more dollars as well as more time investing in those. So I'd say there's more variability on that front earlier in the, in the life cycle, as opposed to like later in the drug development stage. Got it. Cool. Yeah, we're kind of jumping around uh, on this. But um, yeah, so uh, we're going to jump into some uh, group questions because I know we have quite a few that added some questions before, but uh, maybe before we do that, could you share some of, uh, I would say some of the biggest challenges um, that you guys have faced as a marketplace? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, I think one of those actually was the pricing model we mentioned earlier. You know, I think, and this is like a standard one that I think, you know, I was doing some research recently. I think Point Nine actually wrote a pretty good like VC article on this, but it's, it's like the evolution of B2B marketplaces. And you know, when you're a C to C marketplace, a transactional fee, for example, makes a lot of sense. But as you scale, it gets really challenging to like to to really align your incentives between yourself and your end users if you're relying on just a transactional fee. Um, you know, our legal model is pretty pretty unique and it's pretty innovative in a way that like at the order level, our buyers don't have to think about legal terms being you know like legal approvals as much as like. Um, you know, and as well, like, as they might, they weren't using us, but with a transactional fee, like you're, you know, if you have it on every order, you are thinking about, do I put this on the platform or do I not? Right. It, it opens up, it opens you up more to risk like that or circumvention or retention risk. But, you know, as we've evolved to more subscription offering, that's something that actually has reduced that significantly. And I think that's something we see in the market as well. Like, um, you know, very different market, but um, like hire.com did something like that, where they used to take 25% of like a, so they're a marketplace where they connect job applicants with companies who want to hire them. And they used to take 25% of someone's base salary once they got hired. But now they also, I think, focus more on a SaaS, SaaS based subscription model. So um, that's something that like we, we did for a while, um, I thought was maybe, you know, an area that we were looking to address and it's worked out pretty well for us. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's one. Nice. And uh, on that note, because we actually have quite a few people in the group uh, that uh, quite commonly talk about subscriptions um, and especially in B2B marketplaces. So could you maybe share a little bit of uh, kind of like initial learnings from that and maybe why you think it works? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think, you know, I think the thing to consider when you're coming out with like B2B pricing plans is like, what are the parameters you want to base your pricing on? And then how might that evolve over time? So, um, you know, you could say, hey, we're going to still, you know, we could do a subscription model still tied to like a number like spend, but then you're still going to, you know, down the road, someone's going to still view spend as being something to consider. You could also evolve it and say, we're going to base it on a number of seats, but that also comes with some constraints, right? So if you think about it from like an enterprise standpoint, um, different companies uh, might, you know, they might, you know, they, they have different org structures. And so they might have the same number of orders that go through your platform. But if you base it on seats, 
you might not really be doing yourself or even them a, a proper service, right? So it's finding like, what is that, like, what is the, uh, the incentive you really want to align around with your users and then building your plans based on that. Um, I think it's like one good, interesting example that I looked at recently was actually how Jira does it. Um, it's like, you know, they do a pretty innovative model where for different products, they've got multiple pricing plans and different parameters. And so um, when thinking through subscription models, I think that's a really good marker comparable to look at. Nice. Cool. So we're going to jump in right into some uh, group questions, if that sounds good to you. Um, yeah, let's see. You. Hey, Jack, Jack did you, uh, you want to come on? Yeah, sure. How's it going, Jay? Yeah, how's it going? I have a bunch of questions, but I'll, I'll try and keep it limited. Um, when, when you were talking about, you know, one side inviting the other before, was that the demand side inviting like labs that they had worked with, or was that labs using your tool to like manage and process work on the other side or is it, or is it both? Yeah, great question. So typically what we normally see is, so we've already got this massive contracted base of like, I think over 3000 providers. So, you know, we, we do start from that foundation. So typically once we sign one enterprise customer, they have instant access to that group. And then mm -hmm. we can invite more based on their interest. That's typically how it goes. We do have features to do it the other way around. So a provider could, you know, send a quote to like a user, for example, um, and or an email address and be able to invite them as well. And I think as we kind of evolve um, to think about how can we really double down on like those network effects, it'll be thinking about ways that we can facilitate invitations on both sides more. Got it. Do you see one more so than the other? Like your buyers? We see the buy side more, yeah, for sure. The buyers inviting suppliers that they had already worked with. And then, and that helps you guys because, or you have enough supply at this point that it's nice to get another supplier, but it's not not that super meaningful for you. Yeah, I mean, um, I think that's generally accurate. Typically, the way we expand our provider network is we do both proactive outreach to like trying to make sure we have an innovative base of suppliers, but then also oftentimes, like one of the main value drivers for us is like our legal onboarding process is significantly more streamlined than most of these organizations' internal processes. So um, that kind of gets a little bit earlier to the use case I mentioned where like these two users might know each other, but the organizations might not be in agreement yet with each other. So they might say, actually, science change, if you can do this in days versus months, which is typically the actual metric that we kind of benchmark ourselves against, um, like they might say, well, the moment they sign the deal, here's my 30 folks who I've wanted to work with for the last seven months, but wasn't able to get through legal approval. How can we rapidly bring them on? So that's actually, that's, that is one of the main drivers actually is the fact that we have that contract model as well as more streamlined recruitment and onboarding processes um, that drives a lot of the, the growth and connections in the platform. And like on the pricing stuff you're just talking about, what, what stage did you guys make the switch to that, to that like subscription model and, and yeah, I mean, if there's any, it's something that we're kind of going through right now, we're looking at more of a premium tier of like extra data and extra stuff and, you know, st still possibly keeping a take rate as well. But just curious if there is any, any other learnings on like flipping that switch and, you know, did you get pushback at all initially and, and how you kind of navigated that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, I think I'd say we've been enterprise focused for the last about four to five years. Um, initially it was transactional fee based, but I'd say probably a couple years, two, maybe three years into it, we started thinking about like, it's like subscription type models. I mm -hmm. wouldn't say they were like pure SaaS models, but they were tied to some other like spend metric and things like that. Um, so we piloted a few of those to see like what made the most sense, what was scalable to internally. Um, and then eventually landed on more of like a pure subscription type, type model. Um, so I'd say for us, it's a relatively recent um, recent move um, and there's, you know, learnings to come and we'll continue evolving um, based on what makes the most sense, both from a, what, you know, what's best for the users as well as what makes sense for our pricing strategy. But there's that angle. Um, I also think one thing that a lot of other businesses do well is coming up with what those premium tiers look like um, and then figuring out what the add-ons look like too. Because there might be things that, you know, like an integration, for example, that makes sense for certain segments, but doesn't make sense for other market segments. And so, Figuring out the right package um, for those capabilities, I think, is a very interesting one. It's one that we're thinking about actively too. Are you comfortable sharing like how many tiers you guys have? Are there is there a lot? Is it two or three or? Yeah, good question. Uh, I think right now, like 
the baseline tier is really just open marketplace versus enterprise. And then within that, I think there's, there are some like, you know, variations, um, but I think I'll have to defer to our commercial team on the exact specifics right now. And you guys keep, you have, I've looked online, there's not a lot of info. So you guys keep that kind of behind, behind the scenes until you get into a conversation. No, correct. Yeah. It's usually it's custom pricing. We, we do base it also again, like kind of around like what's the, you know, like what, what capabilities will that customer need um, mm -hmm. as well? So for example, like some enterprise customers, like they want like change management activities, they want like, you know, integrations, all those things. And so it's kind of figuring out what are the solutions that they need and then coming up with a package to serve them. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry, that was like four questions. No, Jack, Jack's our co-host today, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Those are, those are really good questions though. Um, cool. Hey, Sumia, do you want to come on? Sure, yeah. Hey, uh, hi, Jay. Nice, nice to meet you. Can you guys, oh, hey, nice to meet you too. Uh, so Jay, great conversation. Thanks for all the insights. I just had one question. I mean, uh, could you just talk a little bit about the the buying process in general? Who initiates it for larger contracts versus smaller uh, transactional uh, only um, contracts? And it, uh, typically the sales cycle or the uh, all the way from the initiation to the closing of the contract, if you may. And do you see any challenges that you overcome over a period of time to make it more efficient? Yeah, so, so um, just to make sure I understand the question, is that like on our platform, are you talking when the end users are trying to transact with each other? Or are you talking like us with a buyer, like from like an enterprise contract standpoint? Uh, from the first one uh, where you have established relationships, now they have another need, another project or program coming in. How does it get started? How does the transaction initiate to the closing? <clears throat> gotcha, makes sense. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think, Oftentimes what happens is um, like they have both on platform and off platform discussions. And that's actually one of the learnings that, you know, I've had um, like recently is, you know, discovery doesn't always start on our platform. And that is something for us to actually kind of think about when we're trying to build user experiences is, um, you know, sometimes they have these discussions off platform. Sometimes they've got other projects and then there's kind of an upsell or a conversation about what the follow on work could be. Um, but they might want to use us to help book that order, right? Uh, and so it's coming up with ways to streamline that experience. And so typically it's like the buyer will come on the platform and say, hey, I have, you know, I want to do this work with, you know, this provider um, and they'll request a quote accordingly. But in the fact that like a lot of times these discussions happen off platform, sometimes the provider will streamline that and say, hey, here's like the quote that we discussed already. And they, they'll send it to them directly on the platform. And that way it's a, you know, cuts out a couple of steps where they can just place the order immediately. Oh, nice. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because and we're then, uh, with all of them, um, and because sometimes if they have direct contracts already configured on the platform, like the, those parts, of the steps are actually kind of they're, uh, they're they don't happen at the order level really. Right. Right. And and I know you did mention that uh, your uh, higher client concentration or customer concentration is with the bigger uh, life science companies, not so much on the SMEs. Um, and I'm. Is, that's I'm sure a, a, a conscious decision because the R&D budget isn't there and they're not making as many new products uh, or drug discovery uh, work as a larger larger companies would. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, um, so we actually have, we have both SMB biotechs and large pharmas and actually like their needs are in many ways, there's a lot of similarities, but there are some key differences. And um, we serve both. So for large enterprises, what you'll see is there's many more stakeholders at the table um, who, who want us to help serve their needs as well. So you can imagine there's R&D, which is like the primary end user, but then you've also got finance, you've got procurement, you've got research ops, you've got legal. For SMBs, they might have some of those groups, but they don't always have, let's say, the ops team. So it becomes, you know, the way that we try to serve them is a little bit different. For large organizations, we'll say, hey, here are the features and capabilities that can help make you more efficient. And it does because they have, because they're so, they're so large, they have centralized organizations to help right. do that oversight or support, um, particularly around financial approvals, actually. Like they've got teams to help, you know, get the purchase orders to help move products along. But for SMBs, that's actually, you know, they don't always have those teams. So the, the value prop to them is, hey, we can give you the same type of agility or speed 
without you having to necessarily, you know, like invest heavily in your own org structure. So we do serve both. Um, it's not like we say we care about one over the other. They're both really valuable to us. Um, but we just have different value props for, for each of them. And for some of them, you know, they, they've got existing processes and existing tools. And so we think about ways we can both streamline them, but also ways that we can plug into them where, where appropriate. I see. And to that, maybe one more question. I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, typically, these companies have uh, run this process through a procurement team, right? They would have an approved supplier list. They would have approved contractors. How did you kind of, if you could talk through the initial hurdles and challenges of working through that process, did you try to integrate the procurement process into your sales or RFP process? Or did you actually directly um, sell to the, the buyers or the decision makers and then bring the, the procurement team along? Uh, anything that you could share around that? Yeah, sure. And has it evolved from how it started to how it is today? Yeah, sure thing. That's a great question. So before I started, I think the original, like one of the strategies was, hey, let's just go to R&D. But the challenge is, you know, for these large organizations in particular, there's a lot of stakeholders at the table who have to give sign off, who are involved, um, who may be, you know, responsible for actually operationalizing the platform and evangelizing it on, on our behalf. So, you know, I think we learned very quickly on that, hey, we can't just say it's one, one stakeholder group. You know, we do help you know, enterprise organizations have multiple stakeholders. So how do we, instead of viewing them as, you know, like potential, you know, threats or opponents to getting deals closed, actually what value can we provide them to help accelerate both the sale, but also like actually, you know, disrupt their processes. Because at the end of the day, the way I view like our platform is we're not just a software, like we're delivering an operating model solution. We're making it faster for you to outsource. Right. We're helping you put in best in class processes so that you can actually reorganize around it and have more time to spend on actually putting, you know, getting therapies to market faster and investing in the actual research that's being done. So with that, you know, we worked very closely with procurement initially, um, legal teams, financial teams, and where we've seen the best adoption actually are the places where we have great alignment with those organizations, particularly for like when we're talking about the large pharma segment. So, you know, oftentimes what they'll do is they'll embed us with change management activities that, you know, we'll do some of, but they'll help own too, like run it like a centralized program. Um, we'll do trainings and they'll do trainings themselves, um, some of which involve us, some of which they'll help own as kind of like the science change, you know, counterpart or champion on their, on their site um, and try to really ingrain us formally into their processes. So we, we viewed that like the fact that some of these roles really care about transparency and getting that lay of the land of actually how what the spend is like across their, you know, across their organization. That's been a really good way for um, us driving more adoption is working with them in, in partnership and figuring out ways to, to, you know, use that to drive adoption. Because in the, the day, you know, you don't, re you don't outsource large studies that often, right? Like it's, it's a, it's a finite number of times that in a year you have the budget and, and the like study requirements to outsource it. So it's a low frequency marketplace oftentimes. And so, you know, it's easy for users to sometimes forget, hey, I'm gonna start on Google for discovery instead of science change, like that happens sometimes. But one way to hedge against it is working with these, these stakeholders at the enterprise level who actually can remind their teams or in some cases even mandate through process changes saying, hey, we're going to, you know, use science change for all outsourced R&D. Right. So do you actually, I'm sorry, uh, um, if I'm asking too many questions, do you actually deploy a customer success rep to manage each of these customer relationships as the program is going, who represents kind of science exchanges, trust factor, you know, collects this NPS scores and things like that to continually improve? Yep. So we have, we have account managers uh, embedded for all of our major accounts uh, and they're, okay. they're, they're a great team. I mean, um, a lot of us actually came from similar backgrounds as consultants. And so they've got a really good eye on like knowing like what are the ways that we can drive actual value for the end user, the process improvements, they can propose process improvements too. I think that's a really key thing for enterprise software. It's, you know, you're not just trying to sell a bespoke solution. Sometimes like given that you built the software, you can say, hey, we've seen these types of processes work really well at four other, you know, peer competitor, you know, peer, peer, uh, peer companies. We can help, you know, you, um, understand the best practices you might want to embed in your own organization. 
So our, our account management team does, does a lot of that too, um, is just actually providing some sort of guidance to our customers around like what the best practices are. And they collect the feedback, they share it with us. We work with them collaboratively too, as to like what the new feature opportunities could be, what, you know, commercial opportunities to jointly pursue. Um, Cause a lot of it also comes into, you know, what, if a customer says, hey, we want to use you for all outsource R&D next year, but this year, just these three categories, like helping chart out what that journey looks like and what investments you might have to make both technically in the platform, but also cross-functionally as like a go-to-market engine almost. Like we work very hand-in-hand -hand with them. Um, and so having them embedded with those customers directly is, is very key. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Those, those were great questions. Yeah, thanks for uh, sharing more, Jay. Um, hey, so uh, Marina actually, uh, I think she had to jump off, but she added some questions to the uh, to our Google Doc um, and sent me a, a note about it. Um, but she wanted to ask about uh, how does blog, uh, like a blog and any kind of content, um, you know, is, is that something that you guys uh, prioritize uh, as far as marketing? So like what our pro product marketing strategy yeah. looks like? <clears throat> no, that's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's one that we've been evolving on um, recently too. Um, so we've got a very small, like very lean uh, marketing team. Um, we've got one person who's like the director of marketing and she's great. But one of the things that we try to do, given that we're a leaner company is how can we like support that one role in building out content? Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I've done as a product manager is actually when we get close to releasing a project um, as part of that harvest bucket of activities I mentioned earlier, it's, you know, how can we either come up with a blog post and support that or come up with a video or come up with some sort of, you know, um, content that can show the problem we're trying to solve and help them leverage that when selling. So we, we do some, right now we do some thought capital pieces, we do some blog posts, but a lot of it, again, it's an, we're enterprise software and oftentimes we rely on enterprise stakeholders um, to help drive adoption. And so it's oftentimes coming up with content that can support them. So we might say, hey, um, you know, um, like R and D ops manager, um, here's, you know, here's a new feature we just released. It gives you more visibility into what's going on. It gives you an easier way to get notifications about the things you care about. So you can support your team. Um, you know, we'll send out those types of content to them directly with the relevant collateral, um, how to tutorials and stuff like that. So we'll take both a public like product marketing angle with some blog posts and things like that. But we also very much try to use our direct relationships to help, um, to help customers see the full value of our platform as well. Awesome. Cool. Thanks for uh, sharing more on that. So cool. Well, I think uh, that kind of wraps up some of the questions that we have. Um, but yeah, is it so before we kind of wrap up the, uh, the conversation, uh, is, th is there any kind of like key insights that, uh, you know, you've learned um, with Science Exchange that maybe would be helpful for us as kind of marketplace founders? Yeah, sure thing. So one that I think is particularly interesting is thinking about um, like the evolution of B2B marketplaces in general. Um, so one thing that's becoming more common is like once you like B2B marketplaces re require a lot more complex workflows um, and you know, establishing trust. We talked about trust earlier, but we didn't really touch upon how to serve complex workflows. And I think a lot of like market um, places have built in-house tools around, you know, that can be standalone, like set to let them be SaaS enabled marketplaces, right? Like a standalone tool that can, you know, people can come for that tool and then they can also, you know, you know, hang out with the network. I think that's a really interesting movement. I think we're going to see a lot of that, but I actually have a slightly, um, I have like a nuanced view on it. Um, so I think like in a lot of cases, it makes sense for marketplace to build those tools in-house. But I think in cases where we're talking about like highly regulated spaces where there's existing competitors for those IT solutions um, and new entrants coming in, like where you have to have really fine tuned um, like SaaS tools and stuff like that. I think for markets like particularly our own, I think it's gonna be not just building things in house but thinking about the partnership ecosystem and how you can plug in there. And I think that's something that I actually haven't seen too much written about in like the, like the literature I've read, but I think that's gonna be a really key thing to think about is, you know, what, like which game do you play? Um, are you playing the whole chain of the workflow or do you say, I own these two pieces and then these other, you know, like for us, it might be a, a like chart lab notebook. It might be, 
a tool that helps you use AI for d- drug discovery. Like us investing fully into all of those right now would be, you know, would be massive investments. But there are a lot of companies that do that today. And I can see the future for SaaS enabled marketplaces for um, like particularly regulated and complex categ- like, you know, categories of marketplaces evolving to actually do more partnership offerings and joint offerings with that. So I think that's, that's one thing that I've kind of thought about more because my own thoughts on it have changed for the last couple of years because initially I was like, we should be the command center to do all of R&D. And I think there's some you know, opportunities like that, but I also think there's a lot to think about from the perspective of who else can you work with to jointly serve your customers in, in the best way possible. Yeah, that's a great insight. Um, I've actually kind of been thinking about that too myself. Uh, so it sounds like, you know, it might be a round two for a, for a group chat or a, or a blog post on your part. So <laughs> yeah, I'd lo- lo- love to come, come talk about that. Yeah. More so cool. Um, so before we wrap it up, uh, you know, where can we, where can we keep up with you? Where can we follow you? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, feel free to message me on LinkedIn. Um, and then actually on a side note, quick little plug, I uh, started a, a podcast called Wicked Hard Decisions. Um, so it's where, you know, leaders will share lessons from their toughest choices and decisions they've had to make. So feel free to follow that if I haven't bored you today um, for, for other content. And that's not marketplaces specific. It's really hard decisions in general with a particular focus on business and product. But, um, you know, that's, a, that's another, another thing I've been working on. Awesome. Yeah, we'll definitely check it out now. I'll include it in the uh, description to this too. So well, thanks for joining us, Jay. This was a super insightful chat and it was uh, great to learn more about Science Exchange. So yeah, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Awesome. Thanks everyone.